Okay, uh, you won the Audience Award in Singapore International, and now the film is opening in Singapore. How do you feel about the success? <laughs> Great. I mean, yeah, and hopefully we go from strength to strength. But it's also been a long journey to get here, so as it definitely a sense of relief as well that the film is finally um, getting to meet its audience in a sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but did you expect? Yeah, I, I would say after five years of making it, um, <laughs> we we hoped to expect, and we're expecting along the way here and there little clues here and there that people might be into this kind of work um, because of course we tell people along the way what we're doing so i i wouldn't say i would say i'm still surprised at the reception but at the same time i knew there were people that needed something like this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the film op has already opened in singapore it will open um august 11th at the projector April, uh, one of the not August. Oh, sorry, sorry. April. <laughs> it will open April 11th at the Projector, one of uh, the independent cinemas in Singapore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And as far as I have read, uh, the tickets are uh, almost sold out already, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, sold I think out. they're currently all sold out for both both screenings. Mm. Well, how do you explain this success? Why did people like the documentary so much, in your opinion? Um, I think, I mean, part of the reason which we can't ignore it has nothing to do with the film itself, but the fact that, you know, two, it's two screenings and um, theaters are not allowed to be at 100% capacity right now. So um, just like being prudent about it like that that's definitely a part of the reason but um also i i mean i think singapore doesn't have that many chances to look at itself in the mirror in such an unvarnished way um and i you know i i i think that that's something that people have connected to you know seeing something not just like relatable, but honest on screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And can you tell me a bit about how did you come together to shoot this film and why did you choose this subject? Mm. Come together. Um, well, uh, essentially we came together through a mutual friend who was also in the film school I was in. And so uh, we were studying film and it ended up meeting mutual friends and Shaman was definitely part of that. And from that point on, we connected on, on film and, and growing as, as filmmakers and we knew each other's uh, uh, hobbies and what interests we had. So I think that's kind of what started it. And then eventually along the way, I was thinking of a documentary project and I ran to a bunch of different references and documentaries I've seen from Chris Marker, um, Santale to uh, Baraka and Tamsara from um, more recent times. And so I think when we started showing each other that and thinking, how can we apply that in Singapore? Because uh, we, we realized there are certain themes that we, we liked about um, what was happening in Singapore, but at the same time, we weren't seeing it in like actual film or in, in, in media. So I think we found like something that we, we wanted to pursue that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, can you tell me a bit, how did you choose the people that you interviewed for the film? Um, I think it was quite an organic process. We knew some of the themes that we wanted to cover and we were really focused on having a wide swath of people and, you know, kind of, and so for 90% of the interviewees we had, we met them on the street um, while we were filming that day. We just came across them and they, we were lucky enough that they gave us their time and shared their stories with us. Then, like, further along in the process, after we had put some of the main pieces in place, we knew that we wanted a diversity of opinion. So if we had somebody talking um, on a subject from one point of view, we would try to get that from another point of view and find an interviewee who could share that perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, was it difficult to make them open up 
because some of the interviews are rather personal. Um, it, it wasn't difficult. Uh, I mean, I guess one of the things is that we, we did shoot over a long period of time and we did speak to many, many people. So in that sense, you know, we were just able through perseverance to find the people who would open up. But honestly, it was a really pleasantly, it was a pleasant surprise that um, people really wanted to share and, and to be heard. Um, so over the course of the conversation, it was a very natural opening up. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why do you feel that the people nowadays are so easy to get on camera? Like, I think like 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't that way. People were ashamed or afraid. Now they are all eager to get on camera. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I, I don't have enough experience to know that. Like, that's true across the board. I guess for like John and myself, like we were a very small team. So we probably didn't come off as like particularly intimidating. But in another sense, I guess cameras are all around us in a way that they haven't been in any other time in history. So maybe a familiarity with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, how big was your crew actually when you were shooting? You're, um, you're looking at it. You're looking at, you're <laughs> looking at it. <laughs> yeah, the majority of the time yeah, we, there were we occasionally there were yeah. we occasionally had one one extra person to translate um, for certain languages that we might not speak so well. But but mo the bulk of the time, as Shaman said, is uh, two two of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long? Did I guess in, in, in the sense you can say two of us yeah, plus the plus the person. Okay, okay. And how long were you shooting for? How, how much time? Um, our very first day of shoot was um, the day Lee Kuan Yew passed. Um, at that point in time, John and I had been talking about this film for many months. And um, we knew that he was sick. And we knew that that would be a part of the film because it's um, near impossible to discuss Singapore in the way that we wanted to without mention of him. So when he passed, we knew that that was like a historic moment that we needed to capture. And um, it was so fortuitous, actually, because I had a full time job at the time. And I my last day of work was Friday. And I thought that I was going to have a couple weeks off. John was in Hong Kong at the time and he'd come back and then we'd get the ball rolling. But um, on Monday, Lee Kuan Yew passed, and I remember calling John up, and he was in Hong Kong, and it's like, is this it? Do we go? And so I, yeah, got the show on the road that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. But how long did it take you to shoot the whole thing? Oh, so that was the first day, and then um, very loosely, principal photography sort of ended on, in August, um, that year around National Day. And then after that, as the editing process went along, we did some pickup shoots as well. Um, and that continued for another year or so, but that was much more sporadic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, you mentioned it took you five years to finish the whole thing. Why? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, uh, well, yeah, as we said, about a year and a half two years of shooting and pickup shots and, and all that. Another part of it was, to be honest, is uh, quite is the is life, you know. Um, at the time, I think right after principal photography, Xiaoman went to NYU and, and New York, and then I was doing full-time working in, in Singapore, and we still kept in touch, and we still kept working on it here and there, but, like, that's just how it is. We wanted to self-fund this, and um, we wanted to kind of own it, the vision 100%. Because, um, as you said, a lot of people opened up very personally, and in Singapore, it's possible that um, if we had funding or we had government-backed money, we might not be able to get those opinions so authentically across. And so, we want to protect that and protect the vision and protect the authenticity of the of the people being interviewed. And so, that plus life plus you know just things and and all that yeah and i think just and like ended up, yeah, yeah the the process of polishing the film down because we had hundreds of hours of footage and i think right before i left for film school we had a great three-hour cut 
Um, but take like that three hour cut to the, you know, runtime that we have now, that process of polishing, I think that was something where we just needed to like step away from it and come back to it to like figure out where that fat could be trimmed. Mm -hmm. And uh, was there any, let's say, interesting episodes during the shooting? <laughs> with so many people, you must have some stories. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. John? <laughs> well, there's so many, but I, I would definitely always bring up this. Um, when we were, there was a sequence of uh, maybe like four in the morning, we were following some, some uh, national service Soldiers there was their passing then, out parade, so they march through yeah. the night, and they have yeah. a ceremony in the morning, like at, at sunrise. Well, Go on. And uh, I, I think at, at the same time, this is the, the time where Xiaomin just got her license. <laughs> My driving so, license. Uh, our driver's license. So um, we were making this documentary all over town, and sometimes at you know, crazy hours. But at the same time, Xiaomin was like, quite literally <laughs> learning to drive. <laughs> um, around Singapore and I think for that particular scene just before we started rolling we she ends up going I don't know if we can say this but she ends up going across <laughs> the one way across one way to right indirectly in front of a car and in that car we can't see what car it is but there's the headlights and then when we actually start like stopping right in front it turns out to be a police officer a cop car um, I believe and uh, that's how we got started on that scene yeah <laughs> oh. <laughs> So no fine for the for what happened with the drive. To... They were very very generous with us and forgiving as well. Um, yeah. And I and I would not ever test my luck again in that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That sounds funny. Okay. And uh, can you tell me a bit about this sequence with the, the man with the piercing needles? That was very impressive. Can you tell me a bit about it? What is it exactly? I'm not sure. What kind of ritual that is? So um, it's part of Tai Pusam, which is a South Indian festival, um, Hindu festival. And it's actually quite, it's a, it's a tradition, I think, that's more prominent in like Malaysia and Singapore. Um, and these people prepare over a long period of time. They have a special diet and a meditation ritual. And um, they do these piercings while they're in this trance-like state. And you can see that even though there are so many piercings, there's no blood. And they carry um, kavadi, that's, that's kind of the name of the ritual. And they process, they walk through the streets to the temple with these um, um, bowls of milk. And it's a, I think it's a way to like honor the mother and you know mm -hmm. yeah it's a hindu ritual how do you feel when you watch something like that mm. wow i'm not sure um I, I was shocked as i was watching it that's why i'm asking yeah i think at the time you don't have that much space to like process exactly how you're feeling because it was the two of us and there was a lot of things happening around us. And it was, you know, Drunt was on the camera and it was like, I was like looking out for shots. So it, at the time it was very, it was very like all consumed and kind of like in that rabbit hole. Um, but it was a powerful experience. And I'm really glad that we, we, I mean, it's just really grateful that we got to like take part in it um, and that they, they allowed us to be there. Mm -hmm. and be a fly yeah. on the wall um yeah i i would say um for me at least uh because i was filming um that scene um that day i i couldn't really see or sense anything in terms of um i think what you might be experiencing or the audience experiencing because i kind of was full of adrenaline myself trying to make sure to capture everything and and, and also uh, a lot of the music and the sounds were quite meditative and droning and so i, I didn't really you anything as long as I was just trying to make sure that I was capturing the moments and capturing the emotions and the journey that the subject that we followed were going through and I think though and looking back I do see that because as Shaman said is a uh, an act of like devotion and self-mortification and um, 
and a sacrifice, if you will. I mean, quite literally. Yeah. And so um, for youth and, and, and blessings and all that. So I, I felt that watching back, I, I, re I see those emotions. But when I was there in the moment, I was just trying to capture. And I wasn't really, I didn't really feel much because um, of the adrenaline probably. Mm -hmm. But uh, they did not give you permission to speak with him? Oh, um, well, it's not that they didn't give us permission. They gave us permission to, to be there, but we didn't want to interrupt his process in any way or to, you know, insert ourselves in a way that would change the ceremony for him. Because um, definitely everybody there was very occupied. They knew their roles and there was a procedure. So we, we didn't want to disturb that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also the, the Kabadi is something that is like quite representative of the festival. And so that, that journey from, you know, being pierced and carrying it and, and having people follow you, I thought that was the journey that we needed to tell, um, more so than, than any, any sound bites. Um, and so it's a, a sacrifice at every step. And so he was explaining in a way to us you know, what he was thinking by doing that. And so um, that's, a, that I, I think the importance of the Kabadi is captured that way more so than um, in any other way we could have gotten like through sound bites or not or whatnot. So we mm -hmm. thought that was appropriate. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, another very strong sequence for me is the interview with the single mother. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah. Um, Actually, uh, most of our interviews um, were 90% maybe were people we saw uh, on the street and we wanted to talk to. Um, however, um, she was one of the few ones that we, we saw beforehand, uh, just a couple of days beforehand. Uh, I think at, um, I saw her at an art exhibition with her daughter. And they're very playful and they're doing some painting and stuff. And, and I, I thought like that interaction was so interesting. And, um, and I just kind of gra grabbed the confidence at that time and said, hey, we're doing this project and if you want to talk to us, it'd be great. And we met up with just a couple of days later. So in a way, not fully random, but still a bit random because it was just a couple of days that we met and we were still strangers to each other. Um, yeah, so that's how we initially met. And, and everything that you see there though is, is the first time of us hearing it though. We, we still stay true to our, our method, which was react to to what they give us at the moment. And so everything that she said about um, having a, a, being on pause with her relationship and how the daughter is frustrated and growing up in her history with her mother and, and her grandmother, all that, that was all something that we were reacting to at the moment. And that was a big part of it. You know, I think that sequence really shows how we, how we improvise um, our questions and how we improvise our camera movement to, to improvise with the, with the subject, because I think it's that dynamic. And so I think that's a really like um, symbolic sequence of the whole film as well, and in terms of subject and, and interviewers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, if you also deal with the, the LGBT community, what is the situation with them in Singapore? Uh, are there any issues or, I don't know, yeah, so it's um, it's not something that is very openly discussed in Singapore. Um, certainly, in in the law, we still unfortunately have um, the law in in the legal books that homosexuality or um, homosexual acts, um, sex sexual acts, are um, illegal and. Um, it's not, it, yeah, home, uh, I mean, gay marriage is certainly not legal either. And it's very difficult for gay couples. Um, and I'm using gay like broadly, so um, lesbian as well. Um, couples to adopt children or access any state benefits that normal couples would. So it is, um, yeah, quite a point of tension in Singaporean society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, just to expand a little bit as well, um, I think a lot of it also is there's this there's this uh, tension of not trying to rock the boat so much, and 
And when you do um, put LGBT issues in the forefront, you are kind of being seen as rocking the boat. And so I think you might get some sort of um, feedback or in, in a way, uh, diplomatic retaliation uh, in terms of other events to, to, to try to counter that, um, to show, to, to equalize the boat, if you will. Um, so it's just something that is quite, I would say, unique in some in certain ways where there isn't like um, violence uh, or anything like that, that I would say um, hinders in the same way we think of anti-LGBT issues around the world, but there is a societal kind of pressure and there is like this sort of psychological thing um, that does affect the LGBT community in terms of being able to express themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Singapore seems like a rather multicultural society, uh, but uh, is, is racism also there, do you think? Mm. Um, yes, certainly. I think any time that you have a society that's not homogenous, you know, the, these differences do come to the fore in different ways. I think in many ways, Singapore has been very proactive about um, counteracting, you know, these kind of natural, more, nat more frequent tendencies. Um, for example, in, in the public housing estates and in Singapore, Singapore is unusual in the sense that 80%, over 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing. Um, they have racial quotas so that you don't have a Malay community that lives by itself and a Chinese community that lives by itself. Everybody kind of lives together. Mm. And that I think has been very successful, but um, so it's also, I think, hard to ignore the fact that there are biases that don't get addressed um, and there are deeper conversations that we may have shied away from having due to the fact that we're so keen to project an image of racial harmony. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I, uh, yeah. Would you like to add something? I'm sorry. Oh, no, there is, I think uh, there is a line in, in the film that uh, one of the subjects said that this is a... Um, I don't experience racism, but this is, Singapore is not racist, but it's very racialist. And I thought that was like something that a lot of people brought up to us um, when they heard that, and that really resonated with them. Because I, I think that does, that does exist. I think you, you view people um, in any part of the world, but I think in Singapore, it's a bit hyper focused on uh, being racialist and focusing on, on race and not necessarily being negative about race, but but just viewing it through that lens first, um, whether your intentions are, you know, super good or, or not. But I, do people do feel that that presence, that lens on you first? Yeah. An example of that is that on out we have these um, national identity cards, which every citizen has, and on your national identity card, your race is stated. For example, so um, it's very much attached to identity in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the first man you interview, the the owner of the small uh, shop, the fast food, or what is it? Uh, he mentioned that a lot of Singaporeans now sell their houses and go to live comfortably in India and Indonesia. Is that a trend? Um, I don't know the hard statistics on that, but it's certainly not uncommon. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it is. It is an interesting dynamic in Singapore that um, the country is much richer than its neighbors. Mm -hmm. okay. And if you could describe briefly Singapore as a country to someone, what would you say about? <laughs> I mean, I think in some ways that's why we made the film. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so hard to describe, right? It has so many contradictions and so, I mean, it's, um, it is a place with great aspiration and ambition and at the same time struggling to define itself and um, create a national narrative 
uh, and there's definitely a strong state narrative, but um, for the individuals, for the Singaporeans who are trying to see how they fit into that state narrative, it's, a, it's an interesting process. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the future of the country? Will all Singaporeans live at some point, as the first man says? <laughs> I, I doubt that all Singaporeans will leave at some point. Um, certainly over time, I mean, I think one thing is that Singapore is such a young country and the composition of the country will continue to change because of immigration. Um, at a certain point, Singapore is letting in a lot of immigrants and now we are letting in fewer, but still, um, we have quite an open door policy. And so who is Singapore, Singaporean and what is Singapore will change over time as the demographics change. And that's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, in the documentary, you chose not to show yourselves at all. Your presence is barely there, just your voices are heard. Uh, why did you choose that? Well, we didn't, I mean, we are such a strong presence in the documentary, I think. Um, we didn't want to draw any more focus to it than we had to. Um, I mean, I, I want to say that it, it wasn't about us, but like clearly like the lens of the filmmaker is uh, evident in the film. But yeah, we really wanted to shine the light on our interviewees and on the subjects that we were shooting and um sh show that rather than it, it wasn't it wasn't a personal story mm -hmm. that yeah, I, I think uh, yeah i think that um we we maybe didn't want to show ourselves too much but there was uh, a maybe an aesthetic choice to have the audience occasionally feel the presence here and there and but also at the same time um feel that this is a documentary um there's still some scenes where the jets kind of drown out the sound and you gotta stop the interview or or like there's a cat that moves you know across the way and we wanted to be you know attracted to that for a second and so we wanted people to feel that there's something um playful uh with with filming this and it's not just so about the about this mission of, of documentation, but also that we're trying this out as well. Yeah, that it's a process of discovery and to allow the audience to be in our shoes and, you know, see through our eyes in a sense, which might, they might be taken out of that experience if they saw us. Okay. Although if you are very attentive, there are points at which we <laughs> didn't manage to do that 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which one? <laughs> You'll have to watch it again. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, so I, I also found that the, the editing of the documentary was really good. I really like what you do that you, you build tension through the footage and then you kind of relax it. Can you tell me a bit how, what, what were you thinking in regarding the editing of the film? Yeah, thank mm. you so much for saying that. Um, it's something that we paid a lot of attention to and tried very hard to do. Um, I think right from our initial conversations before a single frame was shot, we, we talked about the rhythm of the film. Um, and we, and it was both something that we thought about very intentionally, but then was also very much a process of discovery because we had to work with the footage that we had. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a part of a city film, a traveling film as well. You can feel it's traveling. And so how do you edit uh, us going around the city, uh, going around Singapore? And I think in any, in any car ride or bus ride that you do in any city, you kind of have that tension of, that meditation looking out the window and then going going through a, a tunnel and then seeing a neighborhood and like I think we we did want to showcase that we hey we're moving from place to place and everything is sort of weirdly connected and some some with some force and um and we we talked about that that was definitely an aesthetic choice and I'm glad that you you, you saw that yeah mm -hmm. okay okay 
And uh, can you tell me a bit about the situation with the movie industry in general in Singapore? Uh, <laughs> you are both laughing. <laughs> it's um, it's. I mean, it's it's a big question. Um, the situation with the movie industry in Singapore. Well, Singapore. I mean, it, it's a small country and it doesn't put out that many movies a year. So um, the movie industry is quite small. Um, we have increasingly over the years, I think, attracted more big name productions to our shores. So like Westworld was filmed in Singapore and Crazy Rich Asians. So there's that side of it. And then there is the independent product, you know, independent films side of it, um, where Akanga films and Zawe films have really like made a name for themselves at some of the, you know, top festivals in the world. And we're really proud of, of that. Um, and that's that other slice of it. And then there's a, Another slice of it where um, there are more quote unquote mainstream films that connect with maybe uh, the widest audience in Singapore. And um, that's like Jack Neo, for example, who made some incredibly uh, heartwarming and relatable films for Singaporeans. So, um, there are different players making different films in all kinds of, uh, in, in their own ways and trying to find their way through it. And I think it's, um, it's not a particularly mature industry because we're such a young country. So in many ways, it's also like being shaped and changing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but people go to the cinema still, you'd say? Yeah, I think there are many cinemas in Singapore and Singaporeans do enjoy going to the cinema. I think there is probably less of a tradition of watching Singaporean movies. Most, most of the movies that Singaporeans watch are probably um, exported, I mean imported, um, but hopefully that's changing bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And so last question, uh, what, do you have any plans for the next project? Yeah, we're, we're sort of just beginning to talk about new ideas and John, do you want to share it or should we leave that for another time? Well, I, I think we, we both have our own trajectories that we want to do and on our own and, and explore that. But at, at the same time, making this film um, obviously, after so many years and the reception, we do feel that there is some sort of interesting or interested audience and in, in what we're doing and what we were able to achieve. So we're looking at similar themes and, and similar ways of, of editing and, and, and films to Samantara and to our references. And how do we apply that to other themes and not just in Singapore, but around the world? Maybe one particular theme like, say, birth life, uh, maybe tradition, uh, more on, on a global religion aspect, or, or it can even be political. So we're looking at different themes, and, but in the same kind of aesthetic that we did this film in, um, and, but we're still in the, in the early stages, but we do are appreciative of, of people enjoying what we brought to the table with this film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so instead of being anchored uh, by time and space, we would be anchored by like the theme of birthdays. So like, you know, everything from just birth regular old birthday celebrations to like the literal day of birth and, and, and in a really interconnected way, death, but from in all sorts of different cultures and traditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's one idea that we have that we, we've discussed. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I wish you good luck with the opening of the film in Singapore and your future projects. Thank and, you. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you thank for you so much. Okay. See you. you. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you.